Well, we have this message today titled Handling Conflict. And uh, what I want to talk about is what happens when you're beefing with people? Come on. Is that a word that we all understand? You know, how, how many of you have been beefing with anybody at some point in your life? How many of you are beefing with somebody this morning? You don't have to admit that, but I'm sure there's some hands that went up. <laughs> you're like, dang, man, we were getting into it all the way here. And then we put on our smiles and walked into church. It's all good. We've all done that. You know, Veronica and I, when we were young, we got married when we were 20 years old. So we didn't know what we were doing. And, uh, we were a little confused <laughs> about life and trying to navigate, you know, the waters of relationship. And we found this verse in the Bible that we really tried to live by. And it was in Ephesians 4.26. If I can get that up here, do we have it? No, nope, not here, but you guys got it up there. But Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And I was thinking about this, you know, just the other day. We took that verse seriously. And uh, here was the issue, is that we didn't sleep very much. <laughs> we would stay up all hours of night fighting, falling asleep, then fighting about one of the people falling asleep. Has anybody ever done that? And, you know, you just take this thing and we were going at it. And I just believe that if we're going to talk about family matters, if we're going to talk about family, we have to talk about how to have conflict resolution. We have to talk about how to de-stress and take that tension out of your relationships. Because see, tension's created when there's differences of opinion. And that could be about the marriage. That could be about finances. It could be about raising the kids. Teenagers, you can have tension with your friends because you're raised in two different homes and there's different belief systems. And so difference of opinion really can create tension. But another thing is that it could be about unmet expectations. Sometimes you come in. I know that early in our marriage, Veronica had expectations of me as a husband that were built on the expectations that her father, you know, had. And, and here I am as a 20-year-old kid, and I'm all stressed out. I'm like, wait, I can't be like a 50-year-old. I'm too immature. But she had expectations of what a husband would be like. And we had to talk and work through that. And there was tension because of that about not getting our way. Come on, let's be real. Some of us are just really selfish and we like things done our way and it creates tension in our relationships because we're trying to build with somebody, but we want them to be a part of what we're doing. We want them to be a part of or to think like we think. We want them to have the same appetites and desires that we have because that makes us feel really comfortable. But what happens when they say, um, I want you to kind of start moving my way too. And you're like, but I don't, I don't like your way. I don't like that little world that you're in over there. And so there's tension because you're being pulled. And, and, you know, we all experience. Another thing is people not pulling their weight. Speaking of pulling, some of you, you know, there's tension in your home because you thought that the expectations were clear. And one, one or both are consistently not pulling their weight. You feel like the weight of the world raising the kids you know, providing, you know, paying the bills, certain things. You thought you had an agreement, but one person seems to consistently let the other person down. That creates tension, money problems and miscommunication. And so we want to talk about how do we deal with this tension today? How do we power through this and really make headway in our relationships? Because here's the thing is that every great relationship has tension. But how you handle it really matters. How you handle it really matters. You know, and, and what, what I see is, you know, a couple of years ago, um, speaking of tension, I, I had, a, had something happen that it was completely unexpected. So on a Friday, I was in the gym, and I'm, I'm lifting weights and doing, doing curls, and I think you're here today. I was with my brother-in-law, Andrew. We were hitting it hard in the gym that day, and the muscle was under tension, okay? It was under tension, but on Sunday, a freak accident happened to me and nearly, well, not nearly, but it, it tore the muscle in my whole right arm, tore almost every tendon off of my shoulder, dislocated my shoulder, and, uh, and it was extremely painful. And, and that was built, you know, brought about because of extreme tension. And my point is, and I just simply want to share this with you when it comes to that, is that every relationship is going to experience tension. So tension's not always bad. Tension can actually build and, and create a stronger bond. But if you let it go on too long and it gets to a point of extreme, 
tension, what ends up happening is it'll destroy and tear things apart. Are you guys seeing this? And this is why I want to talk to you about this today. Because it, it, it terrifies me when I look at, at you know, the church in general and the future of the, the church, even though God has it in hands. Maybe I shouldn't use the word terrified, but it, it strongly concerns me when I look at the divorce rate inside the church and outside of the church and they match. And I believe that a lot of it has to do with the fact that we don't know how to handle conflict. We come in and I can pump you up and say, you know, God has a plan for your marriage. God has a plan for you raising your kids. God has a plan for the way that you interact with coworkers and people throughout your life. And I can pump you up and get you really excited about it. But in this series, what I'm hoping to do is just really get down to the meat and potatoes of how do we do relationship. I want you to leave today saying, you know, I know how to handle tension. I know the plan and the purpose that God has for my relationship and how I am to conduct myself. Is anybody willing to go down this road with me today? Come on. And see, tension is something that is not new. Even in the Bible, there was a lot of tension you know, you'll see that, that God was using broken people. Intention often would cause the, this tearing and this pulling apart. You know, we saw it with Paul and Barnabas. They were ministry partners, and after a sharp disagreement, what happened? They parted ways. There was a tearing. There was a ripping, you know, and they, they went on their own way. You see in the Bible that Moses, um, he had his brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam. What, what did they do? They didn't like his wife because she was of a different race. So they started to come against Moses and speak out against him. And so you can see that there's family tension. Maybe even in your family, there's a wife or a spouse or, you know, parents, your, your you know, child married somebody that you don't really approve of. And there could be that tension. And if it goes on and it's not handled right, it can begin to tear things apart. You see a father and son in David and Absalom. He was king of Israel, and his son you know, was bitter and resentful towards his father because he didn't handle a certain situation. He ignored it, and the son, this angst built in his life, and you know what he did? He ended up coming against his father. He took his kingdom and actually sent his father on the run. And sadly, that son ends up dying and never reconciling with the father. And you can see with David, it caused great pain and anguish in his life. So tension is not something that, you know, doesn't touch everybody. It touches us all. And I want to make sure that we know how to handle it. And I want to give you this one thought today when it comes to healthy relationships. I've said this before, but I want to put it a little bit differently. That healthy relationships will experience conflict, but unresolved conflict is the mark of unhealthy people. Let me say it again, and if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this down, grab your phone, take a picture of that, because some of us, we need to hear this, is that healthy relationships will experience conflict. It's unavoidable, and it's not something that marks a bad relationship just because there's some tension every once in a while. Like I said, under tension is where muscle is built, okay? Your relationship will solidify and be strengthened if you do have tension, but here's the thing, but unresolved conflict is the mark of unhealthy people. If you have bitterness and anger that you've been carrying for years and years and years and you can't get over it, listen, that's unhealth, my friend. It's unhealth. And I think that, you know, I, I strive to, to be a pastor that is open and honest with you. And as I said last week, I want to pastor you. I don't want to pet you. I don't want to come in here and stroke you so you'll keep coming back. I, if, if you get the truth, listen, it will change your life. And that truth applied will change your life, my friend. And so understand, yeah, come on, give God the glory. Understand that, that if you're hanging on to stuff, it's a mark of unhealth. It's not you just, you know, oh, yeah, it's just part of my life. I just don't, I hate those people. I don't like them. But there's a healthy tension, and I want to give you a couple examples of that. There's healthy tension, and there's tension when you get called out for being manipulative and selfish. I remember being young and Veronica and I trying to work through our relationship. I was extremely selfish, had a really big ego, and, uh, and wanted all the attention on me. And when we'd have these really intense times of fellowship, she'd say, you know what, you're so selfish, you're egotistical, and it really hurts my feelings that everything always has to be about you. That it always has to be where you want to eat. It always has to be the music that you want to listen to in the car. It always has to be the movie that you want to watch. You make me and the kids live in your world. And I'm just asking you to not do that anymore. I'm asking you to grow from that. 
that wasn't, our relationship wasn't bad because, you know, there was tension and friction because of that. Because I was getting called out, and I had never been called out like that. And it was challenging me to think differently, and the Holy Spirit would challenge me and say, listen, if you really love her like you say you love her, you'll be willing to make some big changes. So it's, it's healthy, that kind of tension. When you're getting called out and there's a little bit of friction in a relationship, and you're trying to work through things, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Another thing is that there's tension when somebody holds you accountable to be faithful to your word when you want to change the plans to benefit you or fit your mood. Some of us are ruled by our emotions and our moods, and so we make commitments out of, out of our mood, like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, we, we got to do that. Or the wife says something, or the husband requires, or not requires, but requests something, and you're like, yeah, that sounds great. But when it comes time to actually execute the plan, you're in a different mood and it doesn't sound so great. Come on, anybody ever been there? Is it just me? If not, I'll just preach to myself because I'm, I'm changing here. I'm growing, people. But some of us are ruled by our emotions and our moods. But when you get called out for it and you're held accountable for that and say, no, wait, wait, you, you said that you were going to be at Stephen's game. Wait, you said that you were going to be at Lindsay's dance recital. And, and I, know, I know that there's pressure for you to take that next service call. I know that there's that pressure and you're tired and you just want to go home and take off your shoes and kick up your feet. But you said that you were going to be there. And we would hold each other accountable so that way our, ru- our moods and our, and our emotions weren't ruling our lives. And we both grew from that, right? So being under that tension, it strengthened our bond as a family because they knew that when dad said dad was going to do something, dad did what he said he was going to do. When mom said that she was going to come through, mom came through. But we would hold each other accountable. And you know what? Sometimes there was tension. Sometimes we would argue on the phone and you know what? I'm really tired and you don't know what kind of day I had. And she's like, but you still, you gave your word. So having tension like that because you're holding each other accountable, that's healthy. That's healthy. That's healthy. And some of you think your relationship's unhealthy because you have tension and friction because you're holding each other accountable. No, 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 no. What's unhealthy is letting that thing go and fester and and building up this anger and letting things just explode and go crazy. That's what's unhealthy. There's also, there's tension uh, when you're being patient and refuse to give up on someone and waiting for them to mature. Thank God you didn't give up on me, girl. (laughs) You know what? Thank God. But there was tension while she was praying and believing for for God to make me the husband that she knew I could be and vice versa. That's healthy. And so all of this comes at a cost of being uncomfortable in the tension of learning to love others as Christ loves us. That's that tension. You got that barbell, and it's like, man, the biceps are burning, and it's like, ah, man, one more rep, and it's burning, it's burning. It's not killing you. It's not hurting you. It just feels uncomfortable, and it's okay to be in that uncomfortable place as God is building and strengthening your relationship. Here's the unhealthy part of tension, though, is when tension leads to harsh words, decisions being made out of resentment and retaliation, that's how you know you're on the bad side of tension. When cuss words are flying, when words like you'll never, you always, you're on the bad side of tension. Any form of abuse is on the bad side of tension. And blowing things to pieces to the point of requiring reconstruction, just like my shoulder, and rehabilitation to get things back to a strong place, you're in an unhealthy place. Do you guys see the difference there? That you can have conflict and there can be resolution and growth, But if you're just constantly blowing things up, hitting the nuclear button, just blowing the house up, tempers flaring, cuss words flying, you know, peace being like blown out the windows, the kids are in their rooms, hiding under their beds, crying, you're on the bad side of tension. And at that point, like I said, with that arm, that's destructive. And I just believe that God is speaking to some of you today. So here's what happens when we experience tension. Most of us will fit into one of two camps, okay? We're going to make this practical, have a little bit of fun with it today. And most of us fall into one of these two categories. And uh, when that tension builds, we either are exploders or we're slow leakers, okay? (laughs) Exploders or we're slow leakers. See, exploders are people that they pour all of their fuel on the fire at once. Just, let's just let this thing burn, baby. Come on, see what happens. And people that are exploders, I mean, some of it's just based on your personality, 
You know, you, you're like ready to, ready to fight and squabble and throw down at the drop of a hat. And, um, but exploders tend to be more impulsive, more re- reactionary, and tend to be short-fused, okay? And more prone to rage, you know, hurtful words, raising your voice, and, um, and even irrational decisions. And so let me just say this. You'll never wonder if an exploder is angry. <laughs> you will know, okay? It's very clear. You know, it's like hashtag full vent mode. And, uh, but slow leakers are different, and they're, but they're just as dangerous, you know, because the exploder lets all the gas onto the fire at one time, where a slow leaker, the fuel just leaks out slowly, slowly, slowly into the room, and then, man, match lights, and boom, there's a huge explosion. And what, what the slow leakers usually do is they often take it, and take it and take it till they can't take it anymore. And they let that resentment build up on the inside and they hold on to that offense. They start taking mental note of, I remember when you did this. And I remember, oh, there they go doing it again. There he goes again, lying again. There she is, not keeping a word again. There, you know, and, and you're letting it build and build and build. And then it's kaboom, the whole thing blows up. I want to show you guys a video, and, and I, 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 after watching, I was like, man, this is a little bit rough, okay, um, because it's real, but, but I, I want you to see this because I believe it's going to make a point today. So could we get that, that little short video to roll? Pretty intense video, huh? And when you know the background on that, the guy had a diabetic coma, and that's why he flies into the gas station, you know, full speed, and just blows that whole thing up. What you don't know is the guy that was there rescuing him was an off-duty police officer, you know, peace officer. And one of the things I want to show you today, and this, you know, we're really going to dive deep here, is that when there's an explosion that happens, you see the guy just pumping gas. Boom, big explosion happens. You first, you see him run, right? And then something happens. With him being a peace officer, his training kicked in. And he was trained to risk his life to save someone else's life. And so you first, you see him run. That was his response. But then you see him come to a sentence and say, wait, 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 wait. I've been trained for situations like this. I've been trained for explosions. I've been trained for dangerous situations. And his training kicks in, and what does he do? He goes in to save what is most valuable. And my question to you today is, when it comes to relationships and explosions happen, what does your training tell you to do? What have you been trained to do? And I believe that many of us, we've been trained by our families and their dysfunction. And so we do one of three things, is that when explosions happen, when there's tension and it's just ugly and there's, it's just like, ah, like I don't even want to live in this house anymore. And bad words and ugly things have been said. Many of us have been trained to first to be runners. Some of us have been trained to be deniers. And some of us have been trained to be blamers. And it's interesting that that guy, what was his first impulse? I'm going to run and get away from the danger. So he cooks it, right? He's out of there. And many of us, that's the way that we handle it, is that when something is not right, when something doesn't go our way, when our wife or husband or our children don't act the way that we expect them to, when a family member, a sister or a brother-in-law or a grandparent or somebody, when they offend you and it doesn't go your way, you're like, I got to get out of here. And you're a runner. Because you've been trained to run, so your training kicks in. Other people are deniers that there's an explosion. It's like the whole house is falling apart. There's mayhem. There's tension. The kids feel it. The dog feels it. Even the goldfish feels the ripples in the water, man. Like, stuff's going on, and you're like, what? No, there's no problem. Somebody calls you, man, how are you guys doing? How are your husband doing? Oh, we're fine. Everything's great. Spent the whole night crying myself to sleep, but, man, we're great. And there's so many people, too, that you've been trained to stuff everything, to hide everything, and to deny that there's any problem. Because if we don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. 
And there's others that when the conflict comes and when there's that tension and there's that explosion happens, you immediately look to figure out who is at fault. Unfortunately, it's never us. <laughs> so the guy runs from the explosion and he stands back at a distance and goes, man, that guy shouldn't have been driving that fast. Dang, man, like, why did he come in here? He knew that this thing was an explosive situation. There was this gasoline here. Why is he here? And some of us, that's exactly what we do, is that our pride will not allow us to see our part in the explosion whatsoever. And so we begin to look to somebody or look for somebody to blame. And I want to say today, church, that if we're going to get healthy and live God-honoring lives and learn how to handle tension and conflict, some of you, you're going to have to put your track shoes away. <laughs> you got to take the track shoes off and stop running. Some of you, you're going to have to take the blinders off your eyes. You're wearing super dark shades and take those things off and see it for what it really is. You know what? Yes, there is some tension. Yes, I do feel unfulfilled in this relationship. Yes, I do feel like I'm missing the mark as a parent. Yes, I feel like I'm not really that great of a friend. They call me and reach out to me, and I never reach back because I'm denying that there's actually tension and I'm really offended with them, and I want to pretend like I'm not, so it's just easier to stay away. Some of you, like I said, take the shoes off, take this off, and some of you need to get a holster for your finger, man. You, you got you to put that pointer finger away because you continually are blaming everybody else. It's like, I'm unhappy because of you, my wife. If you would change, I would be happy. I'm unhappy because of my kids. I'm unhappy because of my boss. I'm unhappy, and you're always pointing but not willing to look here. And if we're going to get healthy, church, put the track shoes away. Take those dark sunglasses off and holster up that finger. Come on. Are you guys with me? God has a different plan for you. And he has a different name for you. And some of you are saying, well, pastor, I do run. I struggle with denial. And... Um, I do blame people. But I want you to know that that's not who you are. It's just what you do. But I want to share something with you today, and I believe it's going to change the way you view your life and your relationships. And it's this. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, these are Jesus' words, and this is what he says. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Turn to your favorite neighbor and just say, you're a peacemaker. And turn to your other neighbor and just say, you're a child of God. And if you want to turn back the other way, you can, but you don't have to. I'm not going to control you and make some of you tense. See, often we feel like we are, we are our issues. You're not your issues. You are who God says you are. And he calls you three things there. He calls you blessed. He calls you a peacemaker. And he calls you a child of God. And when you begin to put that identity on, things begin to change. And so what I want to do is I want to, with the time we have left, I want to talk to you today about being a peacemaker. About being a peacemaker. That you're a peacemaker. What, is it, what does it mean? You no longer need to be a blamer, a denier, or, or I can't remember the other one. You don't need to be any of that. <laughs> you a runner. Okay, yeah, we got the runner back. You don't need to be any of that. But what God's really called you to be is a peacemaker. And you know why this is hard for a lot of us, especially in our culture, is that we see the peacemakers as being weak. We see peacemakers as the people that lose. But if God tells you that you win, if he tells you that you're blessed, you're blessed. And we don't need to give in to that societal norm that for you to come into a situation to make peace instead of making war you know, to tell you that you're weak or somehow you're inferior or you're a beta male or whatever you got going on in your head. But God wants you to be a peacemaker. He's called you a peacemaker. He's called you blessed, and he's called you a child of his. And so we need to work through this today. You're a peacemaker. And I, and I just, I, I wrote this thought down, and I don't want to mess it up, so I'm going to read it to you. You're a peacemaker and child of God who will experience the blessing of being at peace with God, with yourself, and with others. Come on, is that not good? That God wants you to be at peace with him, with yourself, and with others. So I'm going to talk to you about how to do that. Because see, like I said, peacemakers, we see it as being weak. Or we even see it as being kind of a reactionary thing or kind of being you know, subdued and very subtle. But you need to know that being a peacemaker is not passive. 
Peacemaking is not passive. It requires you often to be assertive and aggressive in the right areas. You know, it's interesting, you know, we probably have some, some of our law enforcement friends, and guys, we value you here um, at Hub City Church, and we honor you guys for the hard work that you do. And they're called peace officers, right? Officers of the peace. But they don't, they don't, you know, they're not docile and, you know, hiding in their cars or whatever. Often in order to have peace, they've got to jump out and be assertive and take control of a situation. And I want you to know that being a peacemaker doesn't mean that you're on your heels. That often you're going to need to be assertive. You're going to have to do hard things. And that, that kind of, you know, before I get into my four points, there's just something that I felt I needed to share with you today when it comes to being a peacemaker. And this is something that's going to terrify some of you, but you need to do it. And it's this thought that hard conversations aren't fun, but they aren't optional. You need to write that down. Some of you need to know this, is that hard conversations, they aren't fun, but they aren't optional either. You know, as a pastor, it's one of the most difficult parts of what we do is that I have to usually on average have one to three hard conversations in a week. And yeah, it gets a little bit easier, but not always. But if you're going to be a peacemaker, you've got to be willing to have hard conversations. You've got to be willing to do the hard thing often and be assertive and be aggressive in the right areas. So I want to talk about this, being a peacemaker. So we're going to, our passage today is in Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to power through 13 through 15. So if you would, go with me there. And so bearing with one another, and I'm in the ESV today, um, English Standard Version. So bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. And above all, these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. If I could, let's get 15 up, if you got it. And it says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Okay, so we have this, these three verses. And what I want to do is I want to pull out four things and, uh, that are going to help you understand what it means to really be a peacemaker. Okay, number one is this, is that you have to make allowances for mistakes. You have to make allowances for mistakes. Listen, people are fallible, people are inconsistent, people are moody. Come on, can I get an amen on that one? People are impulsive, and they can be unsteady at times. People get hangry. Come on, Pastor Steve, after church. People are insecure. People are often carrying a different kind of weight that you are, than you are. So you have to make allowance for people's humanity. You have to make allowance for their failures and their weaknesses. And that's really hard to do because we live in a performance-based society where we demand perfection, perfect service, and perfect execution every time. Anything less than that is unacceptable. You know, I was feeling really convicted. Um, I was was at my brother's house, and we were watching um, the Dallas Cowboys play. Sorry, I have to admit that I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. And uh, all right, we got a couple of you out there. And... uh, if you ever want to know how to handle disappointment, just become a fan of that team for the last 20 years. But, um, but this was what was interesting. As I walked away and I was climbing in my truck, getting ready to head home after the game, and, and I felt a little bit convicted. And I felt convicted because I remember throughout the whole game, I, I was getting frustrated, and there was tension because they were losing, and they were making mistake after mistake. And here I was as I began to like nitpick, you know, the whole thing. Well, if the guy would have just done this and if they would have just done that. And I'm watching, you know, from hindsight in this perspective with 50 cameras and commentators, you know, commenting on everything. And I could find like this, like this tension was rising in me and this judgment was coming out of me. And see, when we don't make allowance for people and we start to psychoanalyze them and we start to look at their life from the 50 different angles and go, well, if I was them and then why'd they do that and why'd they call and why'd they spend money? They shouldn't have bought that car. They didn't have money for that car. Why'd they move into that neighborhood? That doesn't even make sense. And you start to criticize and you don't make allowance for people's mistakes and for their humanity. It's going to be very, very difficult to be at peace with them. And I love this quote from Leon Fontaine. And he says this, Um, Do we have that? It says, judgment is saying that you would have done it better without having to prove it. Let me read that again. That judgment is saying that you would have done better, done it better without having to prove it. And really what it boils down to is, 
is that there needs to be humility that comes over us in the way that we handle people. And that's why in Colossians 3.13, he talks about bearing with one another. Bearing with one another means you're patient with them. It means that you're kind when you don't feel like being kind with them. It means that you'll listen to them ramble on about some story you really don't care about and you don't want to hear. But you're making allowance for them. You're making space for them in your world. And it means a lot to people. And see, if you're struggling with criticism or, or being a person that is not making allowance, what you're going to find is that you're going to catch yourself being hypercritical of the world around you. The people around you in your life will feel that they can never live up to your expectations. People will be afraid to make a mistake or say the wrong thing around you. And for you parents, you're going to find your kids hiding and lying about things often. Because they feel that there's no allowance for a slip-up. There's no allowance for growth. Because we're putting that perfection on them. And they feel that crushing weight of having to be perfect. Spouses, make allowance for your, for your spouse. Make allowance for them coming home and being a little bit tired, a little bit edgy. We had a rule early in our marriage you know, she was at home stuck with the kids all day. And I'm out there working, you know, climbing through attics and getting dirty and doing all kinds of stuff. And I would get home and, man, she wanted to talk. She wanted to talk to somebody that was older than two years old, you know. So, so you know, she's like, blah, 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 walking the door. I'm just like completely overwhelmed. I'm like, man, I'm shell shocked. You know, I just came home and just a hard day and I'm like halfway alive. and <laughs> Just glad I survived the drive home. And, you know, she's like in on it, man, babe, and this happened. And, oh, this bill came in. And I was just completely overwhelmed. And you know what? We began, you know, first it didn't start off too, too great. But then we started making allowance for one another. And I said, you know what? Can you just give me 10 minutes to decompress? Just 10 minutes. And we'll catch up. And she started making allowance. Yeah, you know, that sounds reasonable because I'm not getting good results. Begin to make allowance for people's being, you know, they're tired, they're moody, maybe they're hungry. Learn one another. Your children, when you see that they're standoffish and they're kind of closed off, hey, that's a sign something's going on. And pray for wisdom. Do I press in or do I just give them a little bit of space? Begin to trust and, and walk this thing out through faith, but you have to make allowance and not demand perfection from people. Number two is this, is that you have to own your part. If you're going to be a peacemaker, if you're going to be at peace with people, you have got to own your part. Colossians 3.13, once again, it goes on to this, this, and it says, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, that's called friction, that's called tension, that's called having a problem, right? There's a complaint against one another. It says, forgiving each other. You think that I'm going to give you the whole thing, you need to forgive them and let it go right now? I want you to see this a little bit different. We're going to spin this a little bit different today is that if you want peace in your life, you're going to have to learn to own your part. You're going to have to humble yourself. And this is what it says in Romans 12, 18. It says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So it's saying, hey, I'm going to take personal responsibility. Paul's saying to you and I, he's saying, hey, as much as it depends on you, you live peaceably with everybody. And how do we do that? I can't, I can't make somebody forgive me, Right? But I can own my part. I can own my part. And so you cannot be a peacemaker and and prideful at the same time. So you're going to have to make a decision that, you know what? I'm going to be a peacemaker, and I'm going to immediately own my part in this. But you know why it's hard for us at times? Because we like to play this thing called the percentage game. Remember, like all the blamers, and and I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but I know we got some blamers in here. I was one of them. And what we like to do is that when something goes bad, when there's an explosion, we like to determine who was most at fault. So something went bad, and it's like, well, you were 70% wrong, and I was 30% wrong. So therefore, you need to apologize and do it thou is quickly. <laughs> like now, you know. And, and sometimes we go, yeah, you know what? Yeah, it was my fault. And we determine, but, but it can change a relationship, and you can actually become a great peacemaker if, what if they were wrong you know, 98%, and you were wrong 2%, but think of it this way. I'm going to be responsible for 100% of my 2%. Do you guys see that? And that can begin to change a relationship. 
Because if you, if, if immediately, if you develop a culture within your house where you fight to be the first to forgive and the first to ask for forgiveness, think about how that can change it. I come through and, you know, I accidentally, you know, trip over something and break something that's really important to her. And she gets really upset because it was something, you know, hypothetically that her father gave her. And, you know, her father's not with us anymore. That would be deeply hurtful, right? Like, geez, man, you know, you broke this thing. And then immediately I can go, well, why would you put that on the floor? Like, man, if you really valued that, like, you wouldn't just put it on the floor. But who knows? Maybe she set it there because she just had to do something else real quick and meant to get back to it and forgot. But now I'm like, well, it's all your fault. You put the thing on the floor, and I came in, and I couldn't see it. You guys see how this happens? But what if I immediately, when I broke that, I said, you know, babe, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. Man, would you forgive me? I, I, was, I was not paying attention. And, oh, man, I know that that means so much to you. Would you please forgive me? Man, I would be hurt if that happened, too. I completely understand. Would you forgive me? Can you see how that would diffuse the situation? And I'm not beating her up for leaving it on the floor because I don't, that's irrelevant. The problem is that I came through and I wasn't really paying attention. And accident or non-accident, no accident, I broke something that was important to her. So I'm going to own that part. Think about how your relationships will begin to change. If you take, you know, 100% you know, responsibility for your part, it can change everything. So good. That's so good. That's so good. Number three is that you have to put on love. Put on love. Colossians 3.14, it says, and above all, above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. When you put something on, when I put this coat on today, it's an outward expression, right? When you put on your shoes, you put on your glasses, it's something that's visible, something that's seen. And if you want to be a peacemaker, you have to make your love visible to people. It has to be seen. It has to be heard. Sometimes some of the deepest wounds, you know, in dealing with, you know, the men that I've mentored throughout the last probably 18 to 20 years, most of them say the words that hurt the most from my father were not the ones he said. It was the ones that he didn't say. The wound that I carry is not the hugs that he gave me. It was the ones that he didn't give me. And if you want to be a peacemaker, you have got to put love on. And what I mean by that is that love has to be expressed. If you really love somebody, don't withhold your affection from them. Don't withhold your words from them. If you think that they're amazing, you just call them up tomorrow and say, you know what? I've got no other intention but just simply tell you I think you're awesome. Have a great day. Love you. I'll see you this weekend. Think about how much of a difference that makes. Somebody doesn't really want to fight with people that act that way. But when you withhold your love from somebody and you become cold and distant when there's friction and maybe there's explosions and you give them the silent treatment for three days and you give them the cold shoulder and you cut them out of your life and you start avoiding them and finding every reason to not be around them. Some of you, you guys are, are professional like duckers, man. Like you're like amazing like spies. You got a beef with somebody and you see them at Stater Brothers and you're like... Like the way you slide behind stuff and you see them. Oh, wait, I don't think they saw me. You know, even hiding your kids under the cart and stuff. <laughs> Guys have become really, really good at that and, and avoiding any kind of contact, any kind of affection. And you just need to know today that you have got to put love on. You have to show it. You know, I was watching this show one time. It blew me away. Um, I love watching those nature shows. I don't know if it's just that guy's voice where he talks in that like Australian accent. I'm like, dude, that guy's so cool, man. And he was he was showing this, I don't know if you call them a tribe or whatever, of elephants. Would it be a herd? Somebody? Yeah. Yeah, this herd of elephants. And they were disciplining this little rascal. There was a little baby, and he was acting obnoxious. He was over there and he kept using his his trunk and he was pulling the tails of the moms and so they they got ticked off and so what they did is is they like all like stood like in a in a line and kind of like a circle and the mom started chasing him <laughs> and ran him in of course he's all clumsy and he falls over in this ditch and he's laying there and then she goes back and they took this stance and they were all like staring this little like chunky thing down you know like you dare come to us and he would try to come back to him and she would chase him again and after a while, he sat over there, and he, you could see he was sad. And then there came this point in the show 
where she goes over there and lovingly like rubs him with his trunk and welcomes him back into the group. And then you see all these big elephants. They're, they're stroking him with their trunks and they're welcoming him back in. And I was just thinking about that. What happens when there's mistakes that are made and explosions happen in our family and there's falling out with people and we don't know how to show our affection? It leaves too much room for disconnect and division. And you'd be amazed at how much it would mean for you parents, listen to me. Having raised two teenagers and our kids being gone from our home now, sometimes like it's quiet and it's sad. You know, and I love my baby girl, man, and we have a great time together, but sometimes they're they're gone and it's quiet in the house or before like, oh my gosh, can we just have some silence? Could we not listen to that same song over and over, you know? Can we not watch Narnia for the 3,000th time or whatever they're into? But the one thing that I didn't miss out with my kids is I didn't miss opportunities to grab them as uncomfortable as it was and hug them when they wanted to let go and I wouldn't let go. And let them know that if there was a problem, that dad loved them. And I still do that. had breakfast with my son the other day and hugged him in front of everybody and made him really uncomfortable and I didn't care because he knows that he needs it. Show your affection. Use your words with your kids. Use your words with your spouse because this is the danger that spouses, you got, you got into a, a tiff, a little spat and then you begin to deny each other because it started as a defense mechanism and now it's become a habit. And some of you know who I'm talking to today. You need to lovingly welcome them back in. Embrace them, love them, kiss them on the cheek, kiss them on the lips, whatever you got to do and begin to build. You have to put on love. And here's the fourth thing. And this is more of a question. What's ruling your heart? What's ruling your heart? If you're going to be a peacemaker, your heart is really the center of where peace comes from. And in Colossians 3.15, it says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. And so whatever is taking up space, whatever has the most space in your heart, is ruling your heart. Whether it's bitterness, disappointment, expectations, or unmet expectations, strife, fear, control, rage, insecurity. If that's in your heart, that's what's ruling your heart. But I wanna offer you something different. It says in the word, it says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. This little analogy here, this represents your heart here. And there's even some water in here, you know, which I just want to represent the Holy Spirit. You're a born again believer, the spirit of God's in you, but man, your heart is just full of issues, full of, of rage and anger and disappointment, full of tension. But I just love this because when, when some of us, you hear a message like this, you go, you know what? I'm going to go home and I'm going to work on this issue. But here's the problem is often the real issue is like way down here. It's deep seated. You were hurt with your father, man. You never made amends. How do I heal that? Somebody betrayed you and jacked you over and it's way down here and you're like, how do I get into my heart to fix this? That's not what God's calling you to do. What Jesus is doing is he's saying, listen, I want to fill you with my spirit. And so when we begin to pour him in, watch what happens. Pour the spirit of God into your life. Go hungry and hungering and thirsting for him and going after him. Look at what's, well, look what's happening. The issues are rising to the surface and you're not even working. It's just God is just working in you and filling you with his peace. Are you guys seeing this? Come on. See, there's no striving. There's no working and everything comes to the surface. The issues. Oh, wait, there's my daddy issue. Here's my mommy issue. Here's the issue of, you know, my insecurities. People embarrassed me and talked about me when I was a teenager. 
It's my brother. This is my sister. You got all these issues, and you see by filling up and having an filling of the presence of God, the Spirit of God, peace begins to come to you. And I just love this because when you're full of his presence, even if issues come, they can only stay on the surface. They can only stay on the surface. They can't get back down in there anymore. You guys seen this? And this is why we pursue the presence of God. We believe him to fill us up with his peace.